welcome to a nano teachlet on mastery learning and gamification. This is a combination of Bloom's mastery learning and the concept of gamification of education. And we'll see how they merge very well together. So let's start by talking a little about Benjamin Bloom. Bloom of Bloom's taxonomy really wanted to improve better student results in a classroom on tests and quizzes. And as he looked at a lot of the work and he noticed one thing that tests were not being used properly. Bloom felt tests should be used primarily as a source of feedback and correctives. They should not be a summative assessment where it just shows did they understand it at the end, but tests and quizzes should be used throughout a week or two to make sure that students are doing their work properly and are succeeding on every single assignment. And if they aren't, students should have feedback about what they did wrong and should be provided correctives and tutoring and help to make sure that they can succeed on that unit. Now, in this mastery learning strategy, he believed that there should be smalling learning units every week. So really one or two week max for a learning unit, nothing more. And at the end of each week or two, there should be a test that's a check on the learning that isn't summative, it might not even be graded, but it gives the teacher and the student feedback on how well the student did. Now, if the student got a 70 to 80% or above, they were considered to have a mastery level progress on the assignment and they could move on to the new material. If they did not have a 70 or 80% on it, those students were encouraged to retake the test, do corrective assignments, really gain more information about it, get more learning, and perform different tasks to regain the knowledge that they didn't get the first time around. Now these same ideas are shown in video games as well. They also have multiple levels that build off one another, and they are in small units called stages. So if we look, for example, at Candy Crush, we see already that there's 3940 levels. But we actually call these stages because we see there's the candy factory levels, the lemonade lake levels, the chocolate mountain levels, and in each have their own individual lessons. So these smaller units are considered the levels and stages. Further, on all these type of games, we see that you need a 70% to success because in all of them, they have a minimum level of success needed. That would be gaining one star on the assignment. Mastery. They mastered or overcame that activity in the video game. However, that isn't always the end goal. For students who wanted to do more, they could gain up to three stars. Students, though, could also gain up to three stars per level to show real mastery of it, like 100% level of mastery. So video games have that type of idea embedded in them. Feedback and corrective mechanisms are also in video games. In this game, for example, Super Meat Boy, we can see a lot of feedback and corrective tools inside the game. Now, in this game, the objective is to get to the end of a very challenging level, but to get there, you, as Super Meat Boy, will encounter many challenges and possibly lose many times at it. Each of these other Meat Boys we see here is one time that the student has played the level and did not pass. They therefore had to do it again. However, the feedback and corrective mechanism involved in the game is that they could see every time they already failed and how they failed. Now that they knew how to fail every time, they can make sure next time around they don't have that problem and succeed at the end. So. It's a great feedback mechanism because the students could always keep playing over and over in very quick iterations to try to beat the level. And already we can see about 20 different Meat Boys here, including the little bladder splobs of them, of the student playing this level. So this student played this game 20 times already and kept going on even though they failed over and over. That's that feedback and corrective mechanism we really want our students to have in our classes, to keep overcoming the challenges that they are having to master a subject and to keep trying again and trying again until they master it. And if they can't get it, we always want to have corrective measures and feedback measures to help them know what they did wrong so they can improve next time. Now, if we did that into our class, we could apply it in two ways. One very easy one is allow students to redo assignments all the time. The more times we allow them to redo assignments, the more chance they have to learn the material. Another suggestion is don't let students progress on assignments in later units until they've mastered the assignments of the unit they are on. This allows students to really gain the knowledge of that unit and use those building blocks for the next unit of knowledge because most of the time classes are built in that linear fashion where units before build upon units later on in the course. So don't let students just keep progressing on. Let them have a chance to correct and gain feedback on the knowledge of that unit and then keep going on after they've mastered it focus our tests and quizzes not on did they get that summative knowledge of it, but as a check on learning for students. If students are failing the quiz, 
we should help them not fail next time, give them corrective measures, feedback, and let them take that quiz again. And we should always provide that feedback and assist those struggling students when they need the help. Because the more we can help them get there, the better. Now, Bloom realized something that many of us also realize in the class, which is the next part. What about those students who passed the first time? What about those students who really got it on the first time through? Well, for them, they recommended enrichment activities, alternative activities that expand the knowledge. These could be anything. There are so many examples of enrichment activities in the classroom. They can dig deeper into the knowledge with more research. There can be creative writing activities. There could be art activities. There could be blogging activities. There are so many different ways students can gain more knowledge about the subject while the faculty is helping the students who didn't get it with tutoring and being prepared in the class. So this is what we call a differentiation of the classroom and it can be done very simply. Just give harder work assignments, more challenging assignments that are engaging to the students who already mastered the subject. And those who haven't mastered it yet, they can now have a chance to gain reteaching from the teacher, more feedback, and more opportunities to relearn the material, take a quiz, take a test, to show that they've mastered it after gaining some reteaching of knowledge. Now, another option we want to talk about to do those enrichment activities are side quests, or optional points and achievements. In video games, a lot of the time, a student can go through the whole video game. And if they complete it, that's the 70% marker now in video games. To get that other 30%, a lot of games are going to achievements. Achievements are extra tasks that are just challenges to make the game more exciting. So maybe it's do a level a certain time, but perfectly, no mistakes at all. Or maybe it is do a certain activity 10, 20 times. So these achievements in class, they gain rewards for it, they gain the pride of doing it, and it's only for those students who want to get the achievements and want to do more for the game, while those students who are still trying to just beat the game, beat the game. Now, if we did this in class, we could do that in many ways. We could add those quests and achievements in the classroom. We could just create these challenging learning activities for those who pass assessments. If they're done, make another day or two of the class go on while you're reteaching the subject on research into a topic or creating a writing assignment about the topic or creating a project about the assignment. There are so many ways to do it. Be creative with it or just engage them deeper in the understanding. And while that is going on, because those students who are ahead are working independently, we as faculty can tutor and assist those struggling students that are in the class. Vice versa, if we want to help those students go to the enriching activities, we can help those students enriching while those students who are being tutored and assisting and struggling are getting that corrective feedback and looking over their feedback and using their own ways to relearn the material to help them pass. We can go into a later one about how you can incorporate class achievements to help students tutor other students, but we'll save that for another day. So we ask, what could these achievement rewards look like in class? If we don't want to make them just more points in the class, they could be just bonuses for the students who are really going well in the enriching activities. Maybe they are bonuses on extra assignments, so 5% on a future assignment. Maybe they are extra lives or points on certain assignments that have questions that can get it wrong or right. Maybe it's homework extensions. Maybe it's being allowed to look at a quiz a little bit before everyone else in the class does. These are ideas that I've gained from one Oxnard Union High School District class that are very good. And there are many different ways that we could provide achievements and reward students for working at the higher levels and incentivizing them to work at the higher levels. Meanwhile, always for those students who are struggling because we see them not passing the quizzes and tests at the 70% level, we can go help them pass that through our corrective feedback and our ability to really help and tutor them while the students are trying to gain these rewards that have passed the assignment. Now, other ways we could do it is instead of having a score total, we could just give achievements, challenges to the students in the class. And as you can see, in this class that was based on Call of Duty, also in the Oxford Union High School District, they had ideas like creating a funny comic related to a current topic that they are studying, create a children's book related to the topic, going on a hike, evidence of hike required. All these just extra activities that are not worth points in the class or only worth a few points, but are mainly for the challenge of doing them. And the challenges in the game, students will do these. And much like in your class, if you give them these challenges, the students who finish early will compete in these challenges because they want to gain the extra rewards, gain the bonuses, and they want to be pushed and challenged in the class. Meanwhile, always remembering, now we as a faculty member have more time to help the students who need the help and who need the feedback, the more personal touch of the class. 
So really I'm encouraging everybody to make their class their own. Engage your class in this mastery-based learning. Engage the students. Help the students who need it to rise up to the mastery level. And for those who are at the mastery level, push those students to their limits. Push them to their limits of the class. Challenge them to work beyond what you've imagined. And they will do that to just beat the challenges. Make the class a game and they will play it. And the more you do that, the more mastery learning you will have put in your classroom, and the more like a classroom your game will be, and the more like a class a Bloom of Bloom's Taxonomy and now Bloom's Mastery Learning would want a class to be. Good luck with this, and I hope you'll try these lessons in your class to push your students to their limit. And if you do, please let me know. Have a nice day.